I'm going to end my share. And just to remind our participants that if you want to ask questions, put them in the question and answer box. If you want to just say hi to friends and kind of chat, use the Zoom webinar chat function. And if, if you really want to focus on the cases and don't want to be disturbed by the chat, just exit out of that function. And um, hi to Ashok and Ilson who, who are greeting everybody. Okay, over to you, girl. Go, hello. Uh, oh, so many of you who are logging into Zoom may be prompted for an update. Um, I elected not to take the update right at this moment, but I think Gulz is updating. Um, and she says, can you hear me? So you know what, I'm just gonna kick off if that's okay. And um, while well, Gulz resolving some technical issues. And um, so let me share my screen. And today, in deference to the fact that it is soon going to be 4th of July and Bastille Day, we're going to tackle some red, white, and blue topics. Apologies to anyone whose flag doesn't appear here, and thanks to our international audience. Um, I'm going to tackle the red and the blue, and I believe Gull will be showing an example of the white. All right, so let's just escape this and move on to the presentation. So I've decided to highlight a couple of entities that pose hazards for the unsuspecting surgeon if the radiology person interpreting the report of the radiologist fails to mention them. And so this is a patient where if you look at the 3D model, it's apparent that the patient has some underlying craniofacial dysmorphism. And for those who think they know what this entity is, Feel, high, feel free to tape it in the chat box. Um, but as you can see here, there's brachycephaly, there's exorbitism, depressed nasal bridge, and so forth. And the patient had a temporal bone CT to evaluate for hearing loss. And so the main feature in this patient is that the jugular over here can be seen protruding way into the middle ear space and is right up against the malleus in front here and stapes behind. The stapes is a little dysmorphic. The anterior strut is thinned and the posterior strut is rather thickened. And so this then is a dehiscent jugular bulb. And this is an example of what would be seen as a blue retrotympanic mass. Um, sometimes these are asymptomatic, but sometimes uh, dehiscent jugulars can impede ossicular motion and contribute towards hearing loss or even protrude into or around the round window or, and also end up causing a third window effect. So in this patient, you can see on the coronal images, the fact that this jugular is dominant and projects here through a defect right into the middle ear space. Now, as you're looking at the patient, you may be noticing some other findings. So first of all, quite slanted temporal bones, the petrous apices angled upwards medially and somewhat widened IACs. Um, so that is part of the patient's underlying syndrome, which we'll get back to in a moment. So the other feature is if you were to actually measure the combined areas of the right and left internal jugular veins as they exit the skull base, this patient would end up having a combined surface area that is too small for the patient's age and gender. That is another feature of the craniosynostosis syndrome that this patient has. And when these patients have anomalies of their jugulars, typically stenosis or atresia, they tend to get massive enlargement of emissary veins. So you'll see here, there is a huge mastoid emissary vein right over there. There's a very big central occipital emissary vein and there is a, a large right mastoid emissary vein. So the deal is that uh, these patients have syndromes resulting in premature fusion of the cranial sutures and together with those syndromes they have both anomalies of the skull base as well as 
in utero development of abnormal vessels with areas of segmental hyperplasia and aplasia of the um, sigmoid and jugular veins. And so from a surgical perspective, these kids have an increased incidence of jugular vein dehiscence. And with the relatively small cross-sectional area of the jugular foramen or of the jugulars as they exit the skull, normally relatively small emissary veins that exist in all of us tend to enlarge fairly dramatically and those pose another potential risk to the surgeon who may be operating on the mastoid um, or on the um, posterior fossa because these kids also sometimes have curing malformations. So um, Dr. Manaswala is correct. This patient does have APID syndrome. APID syndrome is one of the craniosynostoses with bicoronal craniosynostosis and usually a very wide sagittal suture of birth. Um, many, or if not most, of the syndromic craniosynostoses have a jugular foraminal um, stenosis. And then with that, they, they are predisposed to developing these um, dehiscent jugulars as well. So that's the first patient. And now to move on to some arterial abnormalities. Um, so as we look at the carotid arteries, first of all, this next patient um, also came in with hearing loss. And interestingly, this patient had sensory neural hearing loss and the original CT that was performed showed normal in the ear structures, but showed this curious course of both internal carotid arteries bilaterally. And so this anomaly um, is a potentially a cause of a red retrotympanic mass. And what you see here on these axial images is that the ascending carotid artery is juxtaposed to the jugular bulb without the normal little intervening bone that you normally see. And then it courses superiorly and laterally over the cochlear promontory where it is exposed. It's of smaller caliber than the rest of the petrous carotid and it lacks the normal bone of the carotid canal. So it causes ventrally to rejoin the normal horizontal petrous carotid. And as you can see, this anomaly in this patient is bilateral. So this is known as an aberrant internal carotid artery. And as you can see it on the coronal images, this vessel uh, courses upwards over the promontory where it's exposed. So it can be seen right up against the tympanic membrane. And it comes up via the uh, artery, the uh, foramen tympanic, sorry, the um, canal that would normally house the uh, inferior tympanic artery, so the inferior tympanic canaliculus. So um, this is known as an aberrant internal carotid artery. It must be distinguished from what you see in adults where an artery can become ectatic over time and can ultimately erode bone and protrude into the middle ear space. So this embryologic abnormality results from, it's thought to result from atresia of a segment of the internal carotid artery, which then gets replaced by a branch of the ascending pharyngeal artery, which courses upwards at the, as the artery of the, uh, or the inferior tympanic artery, and then eventually rejoins the petrous segment of the carotid canal by the carotico-tympanic artery. So it's a very important vascular variant to be aware of. It can be unilateral or bilateral. It can occur sporadically or as part of syndromes. And when you see this anomaly, sometimes you will see the third anomaly that I'm going to quickly show, which is this entity. Um, and this is known as a persistent stapedial artery. So now, uh, you see a normal vertical segment of the carotid artery and you see a little vessel exiting posterolaterally and that vessel courses over the cochlear promontory. Sometimes it'll course as it does in this patient through the stapedial crura and then hitchhike a uh, ride along the facial nerve canal and then eventually gain access to the middle cranial fossa where it becomes typically the middle meningeal artery. And one of the clues to this rare anomaly is that where you would normally see foramen spinosum behind foramen ovale, you don't in this case. 
Um, so this embryological variant can occur unilaterally or bilaterally and has an increased incidence in children with facies association. Um, so because of time constraints, I'm not going to show you that uh, anomaly as well. Um, just to show you the last PowerPoint here, this again is a vessel which derives from faulty development of the branchial apparatus. And originally this vessel was part of the hyoid artery, which persists, it's supposed to involute over time, and it persists. And the surgical relevance is that it courses through, as you can see here, between the crura of the stapes and is another cause of a reddish mass within the middle ear space. So are there any questions at this point? Um, okay, so let's see here. Lateralized internal carotid arteries sometimes can pose a challenge. Any practical teaching points? Yes. So it is interesting to Dr. Chowdhury, we do periodically see patients who have an internal carotid artery that is of normal caliber, is somewhat more lateralized than normal. I think the key feature to the aberrant internal carotid artery is that it's very closely approximated to the jugular. It comes up through the, uh, the inferior tympanic canaliculus, and it is of smaller caliber, caliber, caliber than a normal carotid artery. And then the other key point is that it courses right over the promontory and, and has that deficient osseous margin. Um, either way, it's important to make sure, particularly when using structured reports, that you have something in there about the vessels, that you look carefully at the carotid and the jugular in all patients, that you comment on findings such as uh, high riding jugular, you look critically at the osseous covering, you look at the course of the carotids, and then look specifically for foramen splenosum. I will say that the arterial anomalies are incredibly uncommon, um, and so, Periodically, there are cases that are just missed because people just forget to look for them. So you, you kind of have to look at them on all patients. Make sure you see foramen and spinoza. Make sure you look at the carotid artery. And, and particularly, I don't know if Justin wants to comment, but for those patients who are going to have procedures to the um, eustachian tube, so and if they have chronic ongoing eustachian tube dysfunction, and they're beyond the age of dealing with that by doing an adenoidectomy or something, you know, in our institution, they do actually dilatations of the eustachian tube, and there they really, really need to know that the carotid adjacent to the eustachian tube is normal in its course and has normal osseous covering. Justin, do you want to comment? Um, not much more to say other than I agree. We get CAT scans on all these people before we do the balloon eustachian tube dilation. I usually talk to Gull to make sure she agrees that there's some bone covering over the carotid artery. Absolutely, absolutely agree. Okay, so that is um, my presentation. I'm gonna stop my share and hand over to Bill, who hopefully has, um, are there any criteria for a high riding jugular? So that's an interesting question. I have heard that, and I'll be interested to see what Amy Felice and Gull say, but I have heard that um, it's considered high riding if it pro projects above the base of the internal auditory meatus in terms of how high it goes. Um, so that's the criteria we use. And then another question about the facey patient, the face patients. Um, these patients have, as you know, regional craniofacial hemangiomas and midline hemangiomas, and these patients get put onto treatment sometimes with propanolol. And does the persistence to pedial artery caliber change? Interesting question, one that I've not particularly noticed. Um, you'd have to have, you know, uh, additional MRAs and, and specifically know about whether the patient's on propanol treatment. So I don't actually know the answer to that. And then Dr. Defour, thanks for joining us, Dr. Defour. Is balloon dilatation not limited to the medial part of the eustachian tube? Question for Justin, for Dr. Golub. Balloon dilation, we typically do it trans transnasal, and it's just the cartilaginous uh, portion of the eustachian tube. It's very uncommon to go through the ear and dilate the bony eustachian tube. So correct, medial. Yeah, perfect. 
Okay, and Gil, if you would like to share your screen, and hopefully your audio is working, it's showing that you are still muted. So if you want to unmute yourself, or I can, I'm going to unmute you. We could also switch. I could go third with Gull. She actually texted me that we could go third. Okay, all right. So Amy, why don't you go next then? All right. Um, yeah, hi guys, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, we got Gull. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> that was a harrowing 10 minutes, but uh, I think I managed to uh, uh, switch to another computer. So Okay, and go, there's a quick question from one of our panelists. She wants to know what color you're wearing today. <laughs> <laughs> what is that all about? Because we're all in blue. And oh, so we've got a red oh, actually, and blue. I'm actually wearing greens. Oh, thank God you don't have a video on. Yes. Um, so the other, the issue here is that um, I'm on a side workstation, which I can now hear and see you guys, but I don't see any packs on here. So um, what we can do is, but why don't we actually um, get uh, Amy? I'm sorry, Justin. Let's let's wait for another few minutes uh, because I don't see packs, but I, I see everything else. So Amy, you want to go ahead, Amy and, and Felice, okay. sure. and then um, me and Justin have like, you know, twin cases. So I think it'll be best if we go together. So, um, so it's, we are not uh, still live. So sorry, Amy, you're next. Thank All right, you. I'll go next. Okay, so let me go ahead and share my screen. There's no ISR here, which is kind of really annoying. Hello, everybody. Um, so today I will show two cases like usual, and I'll try to keep to my time also. Just one follow-up from last time, uh, we talked a little bit about the center of the bone island sometimes being a little less dense. So in this case, you can see that maybe a little bit, a little less dense. And we were talking about in my project how we realized that when we were trying to measure um, a baseline density of the OTA capsule. And I just want to credit my co-authors last time for, I forgot to mention. So it's Francis Deng, and one of the MGH residents, and Phil Tuska. Um, who is in the UK. Um, so we worked together. Um, the abstract was actually presented at ASNR and we're working on the paper that should be out soon. So, all right, so that's the follow-up from last time. Here's my case one. 57-year-old female with decreased hearing, more on the left, oral fullness for over 20 years. A bit of swallowing difficulty here and there and no pertinent family history. All right, so here is a movie clip, and I'll just let it scroll through once so you can get a lay of the land, get the big picture. Okay, so clearly this is a huge lesion, right? It's not subtle, it's a big one. So now we'll scroll through slowly. So you can see there's this extensive bony scalloping that looks like it's not really involving the internal auditory canal, which is right here. And it is just at the back edge of the vestibular aqueduct. So it doesn't seem to be centered at the vestibular aqueduct. As you go down, it really is primarily at the skull base, at the base of the temporal bone, with a portion protruding into the hypotympanum. And as you get, go down, you lose all the landmarks, all the canals that Kelly was talking about earlier with the vessels, we don't see them. The carotid, the jugular, the carotical jugular spine, all of that we don't see. And down here, finally, there's the hypoglossal canal. We lose that also. So this is a big, big lesion. And here is a coronal. You can see, again, it is really at the skull base and inferior part of the temporal bone. And whenever a lesion is big, it gets challenging because you really don't know where it came from. So this case is really an exercise in thinking through geography and anatomy and how can you figure out where it's coming from and what the differential is. So just to make it complete, here's also a CT soft tissue window. So, whoops, let me go back a little bit. So you can see the lesion that is in here. It's lobulated. There's mass effect on the fourth ventricle on the brain stem. It looks like it's kind of hypodense. Maybe there are some calcific foci. But really, the bone scalloping is very crisp. It's very, very sharp and delineated. So what is the differential diagnosis? And in fact, if you look here, it's so close to the cochlea that maybe it's generating a third window. OK, so this is our exercise. Expansile lytic lesion in the lateral skull base. What is the origin? So let's think through it. Is it the middle ear? So here we have the movie again. Well, it's not really centered at the middle ear. There's a bit protruding into the hypotympanum. So we can feel quite confident that this is not gonna be a middle ear mass primarily, such as 
carcinoid, adenoma, or glomus tympanicum. It's not going to be any of those. All right, what else? Could it be from the vestibular aqueduct? Well, we already talked about that a little earlier. If you scroll down, right here is a bit of that vestibular aqueduct, and it's just touching it. It's not coming of it. So we're not going to think about an endolymphatic duct or an lymphatic sac tumor because it's not centered there. What else? Could it be of the facial nerve? So you can have expansile facial nerve for sure. So let's follow the course. Here we can see intracanalicular, labyrinthine, geniculate, and then it takes a bend across to the tympanic segment, no mass anywhere there. And as you get down to the mastoid segment, finally that's getting a bit close to the mass. In fact, it's scalloping and it's contiguous with the mastoid segment, but you would be hard pressed to imagine that this is a mastoid segment facial nerve lesion that is so huge and so eccentric. So we're gonna put that, drop that way low on the differential diagnosis. We're not gonna suspect that. Could it be coming from the IAC? Well, pretty obviously it is all posterior to it, so it's not coming from it. So we're not gonna think about primarily a vestibular schwannoma or a meningioma that's in the IAC. Those are the two main differentials for the IAC. Could it be coming from the carotid canal? Well, that's getting hard to tell now because it's all down here, but that was actually a great companion coming earlier from Kelly. You can see the petrous carotid, and this is all behind it. So it's not really, you know, unless it's, I don't know, a giant aneurysm, but then it's too posterior, even for the distal cervical portion. Could it be coming, coming from the jugular foramen? Now we're getting a little hotter because it's low, it's posterior to the carotid. We completely don't see the margins of the jugular foramen at all, which implies that the lesion is really involving all circumferentially, all aspects of the jugular foramen. So we like that, that's a good differential. And then could it be the hypoglossal canal? We talked about that a bit earlier. On the contralateral side, you can see, oops, you can see the hypoglossal canal right here. And this lesion is scalloping involving it, but eccentric to it. So we would exclude a hypoglossal schwannoma or perineural spread along the hypoglossal nerve. We don't like that as much. Could it be a petroclival synchondrosis lesion, which means could it be a chondrosarcoma? Once in a while you get a very lateral chordoma, but those are you know, a bit unusual. But here you can see that the petroclival synchondrosis is right here at that level. And this is all behind it, so we don't like that either. All right. Could it be an intracranial, extracranial mass or a brain tumor coming out, a nasopharyngeal carcinoma going in, but those are not the correct locations. Here's an MR that shows this lesion. It's sort of bright on this heavily T2-weighted sequence, but T2 really tells you the exact T2 signal. This tells you this lesion is not part of the trigeminal nerve. You can see the nerve right there. And it is not from the seventh and eighth. The next slide shows you the post-GAD, and you can see it's kind of smooth. There is some heterogeneity to it, but it's pretty smooth. And most pertinently, there are no flow voids inside. So it's enhancing, but it's quite smooth. It's displacing the carotid off to one side. It's lateral to the carotid. So could it be a sympathetic chain lesion? Because that goes along the carotid. But sympathetic chain goes medial to the carotid, and it comes up along the petrous. So that's not great either. Here's a coronal. So we're dealing with differential of a jugular foramen tumor. And let me watch my time. So basically, if you're centering this lesion in the jugular foramen, considerations would be paraganglioma, schwannoma, and meningioma. So let's take a look. Here's a paraganglioma. And the classic for this is on the bone window. It has this mottled, smudged out look, like someone spilled water onto a water um, a paint color drawing. So it's kind of just smudged out with a sponge. You can see all this enhancement. It's classically very avidly enhancing. And the difficulty with CT and in assessing paraganglioma on the soft tissue window is you really can't tell which is tumor, which is uh, 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 the internal jugular vein. So that can be a little bit difficult. On MR, you can see the classic salt and pepper look. So the salt is the avidly enhancing portion and the pepper are the flow voids. On the non-fat sat, it can be hard to tell between normal marrow and the lesion. So we sat out the fat and we can tell exactly where the tumor is. And these lesions actually can invade and grow down in, along the internal jugular vein. 
This is a schwannoma. So this is a cookie cutter, super sharp edges. It can be pretty fairly hypodense with mass effect lobulated. And this is just a movie just to show you it really is super sharp. It's like someone cut it out with a diamond cutter. So it's not smudged out like a paraganglioma. This is MR showing it can get cystic when it's big, like the ancient schwannomas, and it's lobulated. So this is quite similar to the lesion that we have. Um, this is the cystic components that you can see on the drive sequence. And then finally, a meningioma. A meningioma, again, can grow along and invade into the internal jugular vein. They classically have this serrated edge. So if you look, it's kind of jaggedy along the margins. The dural tail people talk about, so here you can see it going into the internal auditory canal, and it can grow out along the internal jugular vein, and here it's actually invading into the lumen. So meningioma can cause these sclerotic changes. So this is a different case showing the meningioma that's going into the in jugular foramen. All right, so our case differential, this is most likely going to be a schwannoma. There is no, unfortunately, path follow-up. The patient is just getting followed, but I thought it would be a good exercise in just thinking through how to think about especially huge lesions. So that's the take home for this case, how to think about huge lesions. You have to have a systemic thought process because placing a huge lesion is really difficult. So you have to know the geography, you have to know the anatomy, what structures are missing or replaced that tells you maybe where the pathology is arising from. And and it's all about location, just like real estate. You know where it's coming from, then you can have a reasonable differential. All right, I'll just spend a couple of minutes talking about my next case, which is a little bit funny looking and unusual, but I figured I'd just show it because it's actually interesting. So history is withheld, and I'll just let the movie scroll through. So you can see on bone windows, you start seeing some lytic areas in the mastoid continuing down the skull base, but it's kind of extensive. It's going into the basi occiput to the um, C0 or to the skull base. So again, going through the upper mastoid is okay. Here you see lytic area. So you might think, I don't know, coalescent mastoiditis, but it's not really most of the air cells. The middle ear is completely clear. So then you think, well, could it be a cholesteatoma? Well, it's really away from EAC and middle ear. Malignancy. Malignancy can look really bad with bone erosion. That's fine. But if you look down here, notice this is the basi occiput. So it's a completely separate bone. This is not even the temporal bone. So it's a lesion involving two different bones. So if it were to involve two, either it's invading into it like a cancer or it's scalloping by mass effect. But look at all this stuff too in the nasopharynx area. So it's kind of funny. Now, just letting you see the whole brain, the big picture with the bone window, again, coming down. This allows you to compare with the other side. So it's scalloping, going across different bones, but also notice this expansile sphenoid. So maybe there's a mucosal, there's bad sinus disease, and then going down the post-GAD soft tissue, you can see that there's all this enhancement and it's going in towards the nasopharyngeal area, but looking submucosal. Longest coli muscles are involved. But notice the skull base is actually fairly clean. So usually when you have a skull base um, osteomyelitis with the you know, MOE around the styloid, it's usually pretty muddy. This is not so bad. Now on MR, you can see all this enhancement, cavernous sinus along the tentorium. And in fact, there is cavernous sinus thrombosis. And there's bad sinus disease with a sphenoid mucosal and all this um, enhancement down in the skull base that we saw earlier. So what is the differential? Well, it's skull base erosion and soft tissue. So we think about necrotizing otitis externa, skull base osteomyelitis. But like I said earlier, really around the styloid process, it's not so bad. It's really enhancing tissue filling in the bone, and then there's that bad sinus disease and involvement of the nasopharyngeal area. Granuloma disease, GPA, granulomatosis with polyangiitis, AGG4, we follow some patients for those. Those can be hard to get a biopsy, especially in the skull base. Malignancy, like a rhabdo, like metastatic disease. This does not look like a nasopharyngeal carcinoma, so much like the mucosa is not really involved. And then what about if the bone intrinsically is abnormal and this person gets a sinus disease and the infection affected the bone? So the history was a woman who presented with a URI 
productive coughs or throat then got worse and now started having cranial nerve problems, dental pain, five, horizontal diplopia, six, uvula down towards the lower cranial nerves. And there's a history of frequent sinus infection. And in fact, she had bacteremia. And on imaging, we saw this lytic lesion. And I just wanted to point out, you know, I don't pick up a lot of things sometimes, but here I was looking around and I said, what is this that's, I don't know if this bar is covering it. See that occipital bone? It's a little bit expansile. This looks like fibrous dysplasia. So what if she has fibrous dysplasia that's in the skull base also, and that's abnormal bone, and that abnormal bone got it involved by sinus disease? So on surgery, they went for mastoidectomy and excisional biopsy. There was hypervascularity around the mastoid bone. And when they took a chunk of it, it showed fibrous dysplasia. So this was a case of a skull-based fibrous dysplasia that presumably got super infected by the sinus flora and led to a quote unquote osteomyelitis, although I don't know if you have normal marrow anymore when there is a fibrous dysplasia. But this was just really unusual. The patient got treated with IV and oral antibiotics and completely recovered with um, sinus drainage and with the um, mastoidectomy. So the take home point, just know the differential for skull base erosion and soft tissue. But when it's not behaving like your classic, think about some maybe alternate etiologies. Like in this case, it's really an underlying bone abnormality that got super infected. So those are my two cases for today. Thanks so much, Amy. And moving on to Gull and Justin Gull. Thank you. Hi, hi everybody. I uh, hope you can hear me. Yep, we can hear you. Okay, great. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to introduce Dr. Golub first. So Justin Golub is our uh, autologist, neuroautologist, skull base uh, surgeon, and a skiing aficionado, I guess. Um, and um, there he is. Um, that's not that's not me. <laughs> okay, all right. So um, and uh, we've worked together a lot, and so. Um, I figured it'll be a good time to introduce him to uh, our audience. Um, so there was uh, an interesting case that Justin told me about in which he had some unexpected findings uh, uh, on a cochlear implant surgery case. So I figured that we'll have him present his case first because for him that was an unexpected finding and then I will show the CT later. So we'll do it a little bit backwards, but I think it'll be more instructional. And then after that, I have another surgical case which I'll, I'll have Justin uh, weigh in on. So. All okay. right. Well, I can share my screen then. Yeah. Shall, shall I go ahead? Okay. Let me try to do this. Okay. You should see my screen here. And the talk should now, do you see my talk full screen? Yes. Excellent. Okay. And I will take no more than seven minutes. So I'll end at 140. Does that timing work okay? Yep. All right. So um, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be part of your webinar. Uh, I'm Justin Gobb. I'm an otologist and neurotologist at Columbia in New York City. And I'm gonna talk about a mastoid surprise during a cochlear implantation. Um, let me get my pointer working here. Um, uh, many of you may have seen this ad. Uh, please note the updated ad so I don't look like a total dork. Uh, I added my cool uh, ski helmet <laughs> and goggles. Um, so I love cochlear implants, it's one of the uh, my favorite surgeries that I do. And so I was excited to pick a case related to cochlear implantation. Uh, just very briefly, uh, just to mention what the cochlear implant device involves for those who aren't aware, there's actually two parts. So as radiologists, you just see the internal part. I, I hope you don't see the external part ever on a CAT scan or MRI because it would, on an MRI, it would, <laughs> it would probably fly across the room and on a CAT scan, it would degrade the quality. So on the left in gold is the external part, and on the right is an example of an internal part. This is actually um, a French device, a French and Danish device that's not yet in the US. You've probably never seen this particular device, but it's coming out in the next year, so soon you will see it. Um, this is what the external looks like. Uh, I normally give this talk to people who don't have sharp eyes, so you probably immediately notice the problem here, which is that the dad uh, does not have a cochlear implant, but rather has a tattoo of a cochlear implant to match his daughter. Um, this is from the internet, source colon internet. And then uh, his son also has a cochlear implant, and so he has a tattoo of his son's cochlear implant on his contralateral side. Uh, so I thought I would just go through some of the steps of the cochlear implant surgery, and then I'll go over the case, and then uh, I'll pass over to Gull to review the imaging of this case. 
So uh, the cochlear implant surgery itself involves uh, about five components. So the first is the mastoidectomy. Um, then we do what's called the facial recess, which involves drilling a little hole in a triangle of anatomic structures, including the cord tympani nerve, the facial nerve, and basically the incus, we call it the incus buttress. It's a piece of bone that the incus attaches to. And so we really like to know the facial nerve position when we get imaging before cochlear implantation because we're drilling right on the facial nerve. We, we leave like less than one millimeter of bone intact on the facial nerve, we're literally up against it. Uh, then we put the implant in the body. Uh, then we expose the round window. We can see it through the facial recess. So we're peering into the middle ear through the mastoid. I'll show you images of that. And then finally, we put the, we put the electrode array into the inner ear. Um, so this is a schematic of what the incision design looks like. We make a little cut behind the ear. And then the dotted line is where the receiver stimulator, which is the main part of the implant goes. And basically out of the receiver stimulator is a little wire that goes into the inner ear. Um, so this is uh, in cadavers, hence the lack of bleeding, but this is an image of a mastoidectomy that has already occurred. So this is the surgical mastoid anatomy of a left ear. So just to orient you, superior is on, it should be your right, uh, inferior is on your left, anterior is the top of the screen, and posterior is the bottom of the screen. And uh, let me do my laser pointer here. So um, you can see a few key structures, including the horizontal semicircular canal, um, the incus here. I'm going to go through more of this anatomy when I actually present surgical pictures. Um, so the key part of the surgery is drilling out this facial recess. That's the technically challenging part. The mastoidectomy is straightforward. You learn how to do that in residency. The facial recess is a little more involved. And so that is an artificial uh, structure bounded by these three structures, the corda tympani nerve, which of course does taste, the facial nerve, our favorite cranial nerve, and this um, structure we call the incus buttress, which is an artificial structure. It just, it's just a piece of bone left so the incus doesn't collapse. So poof, the bone has been drilled away, and now we can see into the middle ear. So the whole point of this facial recess is just to see into the middle ear. Um, then we put the device in the mastoid, and then behind the mastoid, and then we expose the round window. So in circle here is the round window membrane. Then we poke a hole in it and we put in the electrode array. Here's the electrode array. So this is a schematic of what a cochlear implant electrode looks like in the cochlea. Uh, and if you were to drill open the cochlea, this is what you would see. We never do this in real people. Um, so here's the case in my remaining two, three minutes. Uh, this is a two-year-old female who had a history of CMD encephalopathy and bilateral sensorineural hearing loss. She was developmentally delayed, but her ear exam was fairly normal. And um, Gull will review the imaging, um, but uh, MRI and CT scan showed sort of a minor inner ear malformation. Uh, the the um, lateral canal, and I should say vestibule, the left vestibule and the lateral canal were fused and on the right side as well. So this is what we saw intra-op. So I'll we'll just go over the anatomy here. The tegmin is on the right, this is the boundary between the mastoid and the brain. The ear canal is uh, over here anteriorly. The mastoid tip is on your left. The sigmoid sinus, we don't actually see it here, but it would be about here. Uh, the horizontal canal is a little hard to visualize, but it's about over here. Uh, this is the incus. And then the facial nerve would be here. We don't see it yet. Um, this is where we would drill the facial recess. And then there's this stuff right in the mastoid, which was totally alien to me. I don't know what the heck I was looking at. And I started scooping it out and it actually looked like a cholesteatoma. And you know, we, 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 we always check the middle ear very carefully on imaging and their cholesteatoma normally comes from the middle ear. There was no evidence of cholesteatoma in the middle ear. And so I scooped it out and then I drilled it away. And I'll just show you a quick video if I can end my screen share. Um, so here's a video of me exposing this, what looks like a mastoid cholesteatoma, which is truly bizarre. Uh, here's the mastoid cholesteatoma, and then I start picking it away. I'll just fast forward in the interest of time here. So I'm picking it away. It's mostly removed. And then subsequently, I basically, I'll skip it in the interest of time, but I drilled around it so that I made sure I destroyed all the residual bits and pieces. So finally, we put the electrode in. Um, and then as a final comment, uh, before I pass along to Gull, um, imaging before cochlear implantation from the surgeon's perspective.
virtually all surgeons will get some kind of imaging, either a CAT scan or an MRI. What you do is a little controversial. It partly depends on the age. In children, I try to avoid radiation, so I tend to do an MRI more. But then if they're uh, a little too old, then you have to do sedation, and then they need general anesthesia. So sometimes we'll do a CAT scan to avoid general anesthesia. It's kind of like pick your poison. Uh, if whatever you get is abnormal, then we'll usually get the other. So we image the inner ear and facial nerve and mastoid as well as we can. And what we care about is the inner ear anatomy, the facial nerve cores, and um, normally the mastoid, uh, whether it's sclerotic or not. It's usually normal in a cochlear implant patient because you're you're doing surgery for an inner ear problem, not a non-infectious middle ear mastoid problem. So that's my talk. I'll pass along to Gull and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thanks, uh, Justin. And uh, yeah, we'll, I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, um, can you guys see my screen? No, I can. Okay. So hopefully you should be able to see all my um, multiple images here on, on my... Yes, for okay. me. Yes. So, um, so I'm going to first start off with the um, um, MRI from uh, 2017. Um, so I'm going to show you guys the, um, let me just pull up the coronal T2, sorry, uh, axial T2. And so here I'm going to double click and make it larger. And you can see that there is a, uh, um, ventriculomegaly, and uh, there are some changes in the periventricular white matter, which will be better seen on the T2-weighted images. But the point I wanted to make here is that the mastoids, um, not looking too bad. I mean, so far, I'm not seeing anything. Uh, there's, no, there's no lesion there. And on the DWI from the same exam, I really don't see, um, you know, granted that these were not like the high resolution DWI and these are not three millimeters, non-EPI, but still looks pretty okay. And then fast forward to uh, two years later, and now um, on the MRI, you can see that this patient has developed. Uh, so let's talk about uh, the inner ear anomalies. So the first thing you can see on this image is that the uh, there is no uh, partition between the lateral semicircular canal and the vestibule. They're basically one giant glob or blob, if you want to say. And so this is sort of a, an interesting inner ear anomaly, which, uh, you know, it's, I, I don't think it's related to hearing loss, but, you know, uh, given the CMB, it's probably related to that. Uh, the cochlear nerve is present, which is an important thing that Justin would want to know. I, I, I suppose that would be an important yes. finding. That is kind of thing number one before we do a cochlear implant, just right. when there's a cochlear nerve. And then as um, uh, Callie had mentioned, we also want to look for any of the surgical landmines. And as we keep going down, we start seeing this lesion in the mastoid. Um, and it has this sort of, you know, this, these are not really, T2-weighted images, these are just like Fiesta, but there is this sort of heterogeneous signal. Um, I'm gonna show you now the pre and post GAD. So let me just go to the post GAD image and the post GAD image um, shows you that this lesion is not enhancing. And uh, DWI, again, this was uh, not done using the uh, propeller DWI. This was uh, done just us you know, the usual EPI DWI. But um, as we keep going down, we do start seeing that there is a small focus of restricted diffusion corresponding to that abnormality in the mastoid. So to me, the interesting point here is that um, I believe this was not present on the previous MRI. So can we still call it congenital cholesteatoma? Could it be a small congenital cholesteatoma in 2017, which then got larger? Um, that would be one thought. Uh, it clearly wasn't there on, on the first exam. And then um, on the CT, I'd like to show you guys what it looked like. So again, on the CT temple bone, you nicely see the, um, the fusion anomaly between the uh, vestibule and the lateral uh, semicircular canal, which are enlarged. And as we keep coming down, you do start seeing this sort of mildly expansile uh, lesion. And there is some mild thinning of the anterior cortex. And um, I, um, I went back and read the report and we mentioned that there's mastoid opacification, but we clearly did not um, alert Justin to the fact that this could be a cholesteatoma. 
Okay. And then, then I went back and looked at it, uh, looked back and, you know, um, you know, basically um, saw the MRI and uh, reconstructed our steps. And I suppose uh, in retrospect, we, we could have called it based off of this MRI, uh, which was done a few months before the CT. Uh, so instead of calling it just mastoid opacification, in retrospect, we could have called it a cholesteatoma. But I think, again, it's an important point here is that we should be aware of all the, um, you know, things that are unexpected for the surgeon and which, you know, they really don't want to like yell at you from the OR saying, hey, you didn't tell me about this. So um, <laughs> that didn't happen for the record. Yeah, no, you never yell. <laughs> so, Gaul, yeah. that's an interesting question about the resolution of MRI, you know, because as you think of the congenital cholesteatomas, when we first see them on CT, they can be really tiny. They can be just a couple millimeters in size. And I'm not sure with thicker images that you have on MR and regular EPI diffusion weighted imaging that you'd be able to pick it up at that stage. The other feature, just a few people are commenting in the chat box. Um, yes, this patient does have diffuse polymicrogyria as a yes. feature of the oh, yeah, I was gonna infection. And then the other question is, you know, what is the relationship of the semicircular canal malformation to the CMV? I believe it's unrelated. CMV kids typically have normal in-ear imaging. Yeah, I believe so. Um, yeah. So, and, yeah, this and is the ukraine. formation can be seen in Down syndrome, for instance, or some kind of synostosis, uh, persistent and lag of the lateral semicircular canal. Correct. Trisomy 21, 22Q11 deletion, Apert syndrome. Um, right. Uh, and this is again um, to show you the periventricular cyst, the classic cyst that you see uh, in the temporal lobes uh, and so this is um, an example of that and uh, there is kind of diffuse pachygyric appearance. Um, um, even the cerebellum looks like there's some abnormal. Uh, yes, the cerebellum is malformed as well. Right. Um, from Dr. Defour, the EPI picks up cholesterol of five millimeters or more and non-EPI diffusion down to two millimeters. Right. Mm -hmm. and um, Dr. Ama wants to know, would you consider the cholesteatoma a contraindication for the procedure if you'd known about that ahead of time? No, no, not, not this. This was just a, a little bit of a surprise and it only added about 15 minutes to the case. A mastoid cholesteatoma, where, where it's only in the mastoid, is not a difficult problem because there's a ton of exposure in the mastoid. You can easily drill around it and get it all out with certainty. It's the middle ear cholesteatomas, which are, you know, a million times more common that are more challenging to remove. We wouldn't want to do this with a middle, middle ear cholesteatoma. Um, this wasn't an issue. Right, and finally on this uh, same case, you can also see nicely on the SWI SWAN images that there are all these susceptibility foci, some of which are periventricular, which are very classic um, for uh, CMB infection. So yeah, this is sort of a multi uh, factorial <laughs> kind of cases. Yeah, lots of strange like lots of different things going on here. But um, I think the teaching point is that um, on CT, if you see anything that's slightly expansile, I mean, let me pull up the actually the um, the right axial, uh, which uh, would be somewhat helpful to uh, compare. While so, you're doing that, there's another question about terminology. When do we use the term CAT scan or CT scan? I have to say we tend to use CT scan exclusively. Noted. Oh, okay. Yeah. Computer, <laughs> so, computer aided. Now it's just computer tomography. So I think the A part is not in the lexicon anymore for these machines. All right. And so on the CT, you can see that this is the abnormal side. There's definitely expansion. We're when, not seeing the CT, just the MR. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. I think I'm the, on the wrong. Um, maybe I have to show it here. Uh, can you guys see now? Yeah. Okay, all right, so uh, let me pull up the right. Um. So there are a couple of comments about, is this an unusual location for a congenital cholesteatoma? Yes, we usually see those over the promontory. Um, and then the other question is, um, could it be a, just an epidermoid, dermoid, yep. That's the same, epidermoid is logically the same, it's just neurosurgeons call it an epidermoid, we call it cholesterol. 
Precisely. And this, this is rare enough where there's just a couple of case reports uh, and that's it. It's, I mean, I'll never see this again in my career. It's quite rare to have a congenital mastoid cleistotoma. I'd actually never even heard of it. Yeah. Right. I mean, I've, I've seen a few cases here and there, but yeah, not, not a whole lot. So, um, so not to belabor the point again, but you know, just to now, hopefully you guys can see that there is definitely, uh, so sometimes you can see uh, sort of an expanded area within the mastoid, which can be normal variant, but in this case, it's definitely not present on the other side. So, uh, and there clearly you can see septations on the other side. So this is not a normal variant. This is an expanded uh, lesion in the mastoid. And the other point I wanted to make is um, often people ask, how do you get the true axial um, uh, through the temporal bone? And so this just shows you that uh, what we use is we use the two lateral semicircular canals and we try and do an, uh, you know, parallel to the lateral semicircular canals. This is what I had learned from Mass Ionier. And uh, I think this is uh, really the best way to, um, to get true axials of the temporal bone. Um, it gives you really nice uh, images. All right, uh, now moving on to my next case, which is also somewhat related to uh, Justin. Um, so this is a gentleman who has uh, conductive hearing loss um, and had a head CT. Um, let me just pull up the... Um, so the head CT was, was performed uh, really for different reasons. This was uh, not a, um, uh, not a temporal bone CT. But uh, the first thing you note, uh, can you guys see my images? Yeah. Yes. First thing you note is, yeah, so he's got a subdural hematoma and his uh, surgery was done, you know, I mean, his, um, the CT was done for the subdural. And then we start seeing all the spray artifact and, and the techs call you and they say, you know, what is this doc? I have no idea what this is. And uh, this patient was also actually scheduled uh, for an MRI. The MRI was completely non-diagnostic and, you know, we got the CT first. So then we start seeing this, um, this uh, device. And uh, the question is, it looks a little bit like a cochlear implant because uh, that's where the magnet would be, except when you, as we keep going down, I don't see any electrodes going into the cochlea. So this is uh, not a cochlear implant. And instead we see that there's this other sort of component to this um, device. And um, additionally, on the temporal bone, you can see that this patient has had a mastoidectomy, uh, canal wall down mastoidectomy. And um, so what this is, is something called a bone bridge. And bone bridge is a device which is used uh, by surgeons uh, in patients who have severe conductive hearing loss. And uh, just to show you what it looks like, this part looks a lot like cochlear implant, but instead of going into the cochlea, just the second component is actually just sitting in the, uh, you know, in the mastoid. And I actually have a slide um, on this. Uh, so I just wanted to show you guys, um, where are we? So, so we talked about the cochlear implant already. So I'm just gonna talk about, um, oh yeah, uh, just a quick point about um, the cochlear implants and um, MR compatibility. Um, so, you know, it's sort of, uh, some of the cochlear implants can be MR compatible. Um, the new and, ones all, the new ones all are. Right, exactly. So, um, so this is the bone bridge um, and you can kind of see what it looks like here in terms of, um, the, the, the components um, and um, let's see. The other thing that we are more commonly see, uh, used to seeing is something called a Baja or a bone anchored hearing aid, which is also an osteointegrated cochlear stimulator. So essentially what's happening is this, this piece of bone, uh, the strut um, is installed into the temporal bone and then uh, basically um, it, it sort of uh, stimulates the cochlea directly through bone conduction. Uh, these patients have conductive hearing loss. And so this, this sort of is just replacing your external canal and middle ear and just directly conducting. So it just looks like a screw pretty much. It is a screw. <laughs> it is a screw. It's a screw. Entire with surgery. Oh, yeah. um, somebody is commenting that they can't see the whole slide. We're oh. you're kind of off centered a little. Uh, sorry. Uh, now? Better? Move a little over the left, yeah. Move it up more? That's good. It's okay. maybe 5% cut off on the right. 
Oh, okay. That's perfect. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah. So, so these are both sort of um, devices for uh, conductive hearing loss. And I thought this was a really uh, nice uh, YouTube video for it's a one minute video, but I think it'll be really educational. Hearing loss or single sided deafness. The bone bridge. So, this is the external component, which is just a disc. And a lot of cochlear implants are moving to this too, they're lower profile positioned under the skin. The audio processor is held directly over the implant by magnetic attraction and can be comfortably worn under the hair. The microphones of the audio processor pick up sound waves. The audio processor converts sound to electrical signals. These signals are transmitted through the intact skin to the implant. The implant is fixed in the temporal bone. The signal converter of the implant converts the signals into mechanical vibrations, which are transmitted to the skull. The bone conducts the vibrations to the inner ear. This implant is therefore called bone conduction implant. All right, so that's, uh, that's my, our cases. Thank you very much for listening and thanks Justin for, for taking part in this. And sorry Felice for uh, running over your time, but next time I'll be number four, so. That's okay, no problem. Thanks so much. And um, I'm gonna ask Justin, if you wouldn't mind taking a look, there are a couple questions for you in the oh, question yeah. and answer. Uh, sure. Thank you, moving over to Felice. So I just respond by typing to yes. not take up time? Okay. Perfect. Okay, um, so uh, let's start with the first case. Actually, there are three cases, but um, if you want to leave, you can leave, but they are very similar and very, very interesting. So I would really like to show cases I learn from, or I think I learn from, but feel free to um, comment for the other panelists of uh, everyone else. Um, I'm receiving a lot of comments about my hair. I will cut them as soon as possible, but now everyone is closed. Sorry about that. Uh, anyway, uh, so this is a child with um, bacterial association, polydactyly, syndactyly, analatresia, and history of maternal diabetes. And uh, now try to focus on the trigeminal nerves. On both sides, the trigeminal nerves, they have this curve laterally, and the Meckel cave is quite enlarged, right? And then you see other nerves going from the Meckel cave here in the internal auditory canal, which is present, but kind of fused with the Meckel cave, okay? If you uh, try to identify the, the nerves, um, you can see that um, the nerves uh, are all there. Probably the seventh is very close to the trigeminal origin, but separated. But in this case, you can see the internal auditory canal, you can see all the nerves, and there is probably a mild dysplasia of the cochlea, which is slightly hypoplastic with uh, um, uh, underdeveloped modulus, okay? So you have very strange course of the nerves. In this case, I do not have CT, and this is the first case, and this is a bacterial association. Now, going back to the second case, sorry, there are a lot of uh, complex uh, cases, so I have some notes. Um, and this is another case. In this case, the child, I, I, I don't have any, diagnosis, but the child has pulmonary stenosis, vertebral segmentation anomaly, craniofacial microsomia, cleft lip palate, and sensory nearing hearing loss um, on more on one side, I think. But it looks like, uh, um, again, one of these associations are golden. Now look at the difference. Let's start from the trigeminal nerve. Again, bump, like they have this course with this convexi um, convexity laterally. And again, let's start from the left-hand side. You can see the Meckel cave is large and continues in, in, in within this internal auditory canal. You can see the nerves and there is probably the, the seven nerve. In the other side, the internal auditory canal is a tracic. So this is not a symmetrical abnormality, but again, you can see a small nerve here going away here from the trigeminal nerve. And again, this plastic uh, inner ear. In this case, we do have, because of the vertebral abnormality, a uh, decent CT, uh, not the best, but you can see the abnormality here. 
uh, of the inner ear, the atresic internal auditory canal. And uh, if you go up, there is a nerve canal here, while on the left hand side, the inner ear look a bit better and uh, there is no clear seven nerve canal. So again, abnormal nerves, they, they tend to, I mean, like they come from the same um, trunk, they are not always all present. So in this case, no eight nerve on one side, no seven nerve on the other side, dysmorphic inner ear and complex association with other malformation. The final case, I hope I'm not going too fast, but I'm happy, you know, to get over time and to come back to, to them. The final case of the first um, uh, is this one, I think. Uh, and the final case show is a golden R. So again, complex association. Again, let's start from the trigeminal nerve. On the, on the right, you have that the trigeminal nerve is again bumped laterally, and you can see some uh, one small canal going here medially. And again, very atresic. Uh, Internal auditory canal, no um, uh, eighth nerve whatsoever, abnormal, uh, well, mildly abnormal, underdeveloped um, uh, in, um, cochlear partition. On the other side, the cochlea is definitely abnormal, looks like a cochlea hypoplasia type 3. The lateral semicircular canal is abnormal. There are some nerve in this small internal auditory canal, and look at how strange is the trigeminal nerve. There is one bundle here going into the metal cave, another here, and then you can follow some nerves going independently within this dysmorphic internal auditory canal. So again, very, very complex anatomy, but again with these strange nerves, and you can look at the seven nerve uh, facial canal uh, um, on the CT on both sides, but in this case, is kind of abnormal. I think this is the facial canal because the, 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 the child had facial function on both sides, but here you can see it uh, clearly, okay? And this child had a golden eye. Now, let me go back to the, uh, this presentation. Two of these cases, the first and the second cases that I showed you, had similar appearances, but some differences, and both of them, one with vector and the second one, they had history of maternal diabetes. So something went wrong in the early stage of development. And if you look at the literature, there are few papers, very interesting. The first one is from uh, uh, Dr. Giesemann from Germany that described similar abnormality, but she focused on the atresia of the internal auditory canal. So she selected only these cases with atresic internal auditory canal. And she found similar abnormality, but without, in all the patients, without eighth nerve. And uh, uh, some, only few of these patients, they didn't have the, um, the, the facial um, nerve. So I think uh, this is an amazing paper, but she may have missed part of the spectrum. And because two of our patients, they have um, um, uh, maternal diabetes, I checked the literature, and actually maternal diabetes in Murin model involve the formation of the cranial nerve. So it impairs the formation of new neural, uh, neural crest derived cranial nerves. So in this case, uh, they point several cases, but including uh, several nerves, including trigeminal, facial, and cochlear vestibular. So very important. And then there is this from an Italian group, uh, and they studied the uh, golden R syndrome. So the end of the uh, ocular auricular vertebral spectrum, and they found Exactly, you see this here, exactly this parasagittal, uh, the oblique multiplanar reconstruction showing exactly this uh, fuse Meckel cave with the internal auditory canal and with these nerves going away. And I need to thank uh, my, um, um, my colleague Giacomo Talenti. Uh, I'm working on these cases, but the point I want to make when you see these uh, abnormalities with this trigeminal nerve and from the trigeminal nerve, some bundles, some nerves going into the canal, whether it's the seventh or the cochlear nerve, an abnormal uh, internal auditory canal with or without inner ear malformation, do not, I think, spend too much money in genetic uh, testing because this is most likely a clastic event, okay? And this explains the association with Bactel, which is associated with maternal diabetes, association with maternal diabetes, association with Goldenar, 
And we are, if you have cases, please send it over because we are going to hopefully to send this. And then, the, so this is the first case. The second case, uh, and if there are questions about this, I don't know, I'm not checking the chat. Because I was too fast, I was not clear. <laughs> I think we're good. Okay. So uh, this is the teaching point about this, uh, this case. The second case is a case from Brazil because it's an adult and I do adult only one day a week um, at uh, San Thomas Hospital. Uh, but this is a case that this friend of mine, Adriano Hadzin, uh, who is a pediatric neuroradiologist and general neuroradiologist from Recife, sent it to me. So I would like to, um, if I can go out from the presentation somehow, or not. Oh no, okay, sorry, don't read, don't read, please. Okay, um, okay, so this is the second case. And he, uh, Adriano sent me this video and say, uh, this is a, a patient basically as often happened without much clinical history apart, apart from hearing loss. And look, uh, focus on the left here, there is this very dense, it's a very fast case, very dense structure in the middle ear going uh, anteromedially uh, in uh, um, toward the, the eustachian tube. So the, the, you can recognize the ossicle here, not a great quality, but there is tissue here and soft tissue. The inner ear are normal and on the, nothing relevant on the other side, a bit of, uh, of, of fluid. So we did not have clinical history. We have this strange the strange shape, uh, uh, shaped uh, hyperdense material in the middle ear and in the eustachian tube. So I told him, I, I've never seen something like that, let me Google it a bit. And then I spoke with um, a friend of mine, who is Dr. Uga, who is a head and neck radiologist who trained in Brescia from Naples. And we started to speak about the, the paper, the, this case, and we started looking for papers because we had no idea what it was. And then Lorenzo found, um, something interesting, so found this um, case report of a foreign body induced by ear molding procedure. So in this case, there was an old patient uh, with uh, the, during the placement of mold for the hearing aid, um, um, had some molding materials that enter the middle ear through pre-existing perforation of the tympanic membrane. And look at the, this case, how it looks like. It looks exactly the same. So I asked Adriano, so this was a, a joint uh, effort, and I asked Adriano, uh, did the patient had molding material inserted? And actually, she had this, but they did not realize, and this is when the things got lost in translation, and uh, so this is a foreign body, a very weird one. At least I don't know um, if the other panelists have seen something like that. I've never seen something like that. And um, uh, all, all, all three of us were a bit puzzled at the beginning. And this is also something that I think can be pattern recognition at this point, uh, although we have only two cases. And uh, um, I wanted to show this case because I think it's very interesting and also stress the usefulness of uh, Google skills. And this is Lorenzo from Naples, is where I studied uh, part of my specialization as well. Uh, and this is some acknowledgement, and this is uh, from the south of Italy. Every time I put some picture uh, of uh, Campania, where I'm from. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm very happy to take them. Let me stop sharing. Yeah, so... Um there, Dr. Defour provided us with a reference to one of the cases shown earlier. Um, there was a question about whether sensory neural hearing loss related to a high jugular vein is related to hydraulic block or leak. I think most often it's due to a third window effect um, when it causes hearing loss. Oftentimes it's asymptomatic. Um, there was some discussion about whether the lesion in the mastoid of the cochlear implant patient could be an epineural pseudocyst. Um, Justin thought that it wasn't quite approximated to the facial nerve canal as much as a pseudocyst would have been. Um, any other questions that we've missed? I think I asked where a couple. So there was a question about if the size of the cochlea can influence the, um, the cochlear implant. 
So I don't know if the surgeon is still here. Our surgeons, they do not find this very useful, although there is some literature uh, out there. I, don't, I think it depends by the cochlear implant, but uh, this is, uh, we don't bother much about the size of the cochlear. I don't know what's your experience. Completely agree, yeah. Amy? Yeah. I think it, it depends if they use the stopper, so, but most of them they don't. And then there was a question about the pre, you know, the, the cochlear implant protocol. So at GOSH, um, the, we use both CT and MR in all patients. And there is some literature that says that uh, it is uh, probably better. Uh, I don't know, we do the same GA normally, so we do MRI and then CT. Uh, I saw that uh, New York does only one of the two, or or only CT. I I thought or no? Yeah, or we one? do both. We check that there's a cochlear nerve on MR, and then the CT is used to identify anatomic Variance, issues. Yeah. Um, and we try and do whatever we can without sedation or anesthesia. There's a question here about um, using ADC maps for cholesteatoma diagnosis? Absolutely. I, I think it's useful to look at the trace images and then corroborate that it's decreased diffusivity using ADC maps. Um, yeah. There is also another thing that um, sometimes came out in the discussion. If you have a three Tesla Siemens, the three Tesla Siemens does not provide uh, um, non-epi, so in this case uh, uh, we use a multi-shot resolve, which is an epi multi-shot, so a good uh, spatial resolution, but not as good as the non-epi 1.5 to pick up cholesteatoma. So these are technical issues that you may want to um, uh, consider, but uh, I found some cholesteatoma visible on resolve uh, anyway, although uh, Bert uh, always tell me that if possible is better to do the 1.5 uh, non-epi. And coronal is definitely... Yeah, yeah, coronal. Uh, actually, I was speaking... Coronal. Yeah, I was speaking with um, Lorenzo Pinelli and he's, he, he does both, coronal and axial. So I, I think there was a lecture also. Um, so, but they are quite fast. So the problem is more when we have to do the in area on the three Tesla Siemens, and then we, want, we have a problem or a doubt on the middle ear and we want to add the, the coronal diffusion, we just have the epi multi-shot. Mm. No, yeah, we do coronal as well. Um, question from Anastasia Kosova. Um, any known associations with abnormal large semicircular canals in children? Felicia and I, we could both wax lyrical on the topic, hey? Sorry, I missed this, the question. Uh, any known associations with abnormally large semicircular canals in children? Plenty. Yeah, I mean, depending on which semicircular canals involve, depending on yeah. presence or absence of bone island, and depending on other features involving cochlea. Depend. What do you need by large semicircular canal? So, if it's without bony island, is relatively common. But the interesting thing is that I found sometimes in normal adult, this kind of um, of uh, unlage, persistent unlage. And the, the, the person could hear very well, at least. so it's very, it's very strange. Sometimes it's, uh, very rarely, is is incidental. Yeah, it's the one in the ear anomaly that can be completely incidental, but we definitely see, you know, lack of the bone island in, trust me, 21, 22 Q11, APIT syndrome, as mentioned earlier. Um, and then you'll see a absent bone island, but small semicircular canal can be also a part of those syndromes. And then, you know, there are a whole bunch of other things as well. Um, all right, super. Any other questions or comments before we wrap up? And once again, thank you so much to everyone for joining us from literally all over the world. Um, we love that this is an international audience. Um, we're glad you like the informal discussion format. We intend to keep it that way. Um, and, you know, feel free to let us know if there are any topics you specifically want us to cover. Yeah, send feedback on Twitter. Yes. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.